Hi all. I had an interesting game last night, um, and even more interesting was uh, John Piggott uh, mentioning some opening theory which included a gambit in the opening which I played. Uh, I didn't realise it was such beaten territory or that a gambit even existed. Uh, so I think the theme, uh, the instructive theme today I'm, I'm going to claim is um, that there are actually thousands of gambits in chess uh, and the reason I, I'm, I'm proposing that, that, that this is true is um, if you consider a gambit a kind of early positional uh, sacrifice which uh, seeks to emphasize uh, you know maybe structural or development uh, weaknesses or strengths so structural in terms of pawn structure um, so each of those positional uh, sacrifices uh, could be considered a gambit okay so th this this is the dynamic proposal which maybe sounds a bit outrageous that there are thousands of gambits which are uh, which we, we might not even know about, but uh, depending on the pawn structure in particular, we might want to highlight uh, structural issues or, or trump cards, especially early on. Or we could even sacrifice development tempo to emphasize uh, structural uh, issues. And I think my game from last night is an excellent model example uh, of a situation where either side can e either use positional uh, material sacrifices to emphasize you know structural development issues or tempo loss so the opening um, which I've had a few times before now c4 knight f6 and it's as if black was you know playing for a Nimzo Indian but this is not Nimzo Indian uh, position and I, I thought this move um, e6 was uh, you know a blunder I was playing Roger Lancaster last night and I've drawn with him several times before and last night was no different but uh, well, it was an interesting game nevertheless um, so here I thought I'd punish him with e4 and he did spend a long time you know thinking here and he sort of bluff played the bluff move c5 which turns out to be very good in theory in fact um, so basically uh, you know blacks are already playing a kind of tempo gambit um, you see the board's actually being strategically ignited by these two pawn moves because of, of this weakness on d4 so Un under this dynamic rule which uh, or notion this claim I'm making that there are actually thousands of gambits in chess I base that claim on the idea that you know such gambits you, you know they're like highlighting like you underline a word in a word processor it's like highlighting structural issues well here there's a clear structural issue of this d4 square it's caused by these two pawns and you know this bishop is is in no position at the moment, you, you know to to sort of support d4 or play play for d4 at the moment. So there's a clear, definite st structural issue. So you could almost uh, say, well, there's going to be tempo gambits or positional sacrifice gambits to try and emphasise or de-emphasise uh, the structural issues here. So d4 is the main structural issue, and in fact, in this position. Uh, you know, a south end one. Someone even played in this position a tempo losing gambit, just playing e5, just to emphasise this d4 weakness. Uh, but there are other gambits uh, around this uh, position, and c5 is another tempo losing gambit. Because okay, the immediate reaction here, uh, which which I had, okay, surely this this can't this can't be that good, and. I was also thinking, didn't I analyse this before at some point with Ibka, uh, thinking that white, white has a slight advantage going going ahead with uh, the tempting move just to gain time on the knight. So e5, but remember, white has a gaping hole on d4. So black playing this tempo loss gambit, uh, knight g8, it's not such a bad and, and silly thing. It's a respectable idea here, because you know as. As I've mentioned recently, and this this plan is very good in French defence setups. If Black can get a knight to f5, uh, especially if White's you know getting in d4, you know this this knight will be used for undermining you know this diagonal as well as d4. So the tempo loss gambit. Okay, now I played a poxy move. Okay, I played f4, which I thought I had analysed before this position, and may, maybe White was getting a slight um, edge uh, by reinforcing e5. 
but uh, you know the queen side turned out to be um, pretty poor um, so in, in the game last night let's have a look at my proxy continuation first in the game last night so knight h6 nice move knight f3 knight c6 highlighting d4 so everything's been played by the rules though in this game except for black's play it's been more dynamic so far the tempo loss aspects but he hasn't invested material to emphasize d4 d4 is just generally a gaping hole here and now i make things a bit worse even though ribka kind of suggests this as a move to try and safeguard f5 uh bishop d3 i mean look at this queen side it's a major issue he plays now d5 which was slightly surprising because i was thinking you know maybe d6 but d5 has got this vicious point to it that maybe knight b4 d4 d3 and i'm going to get completely stuffed and that would remind me of one horrific game i really had at some point i think so horrific um i wanted to forget it so against this knight before which i now consider the major threat i played the surprising move well to roger in in post-mortem i played a3 so i'm wasting a lot of time uh but i have this idea maybe you know i can get the bishop on b2 and maybe this wedge would mean something but he's always got the threat position you know d takes and knight f5 but he was hesitant to do that because he doesn't want to quit give me that e4 square so he actually played bishop e7 so we have b3 b6 and i thought he started messing around now and i thought i had you know getting back in the game so queen c2 you know highlighting this diagonal fine he blocks the diagonal fine bishop b2 so at least this bishop's kind of outside the box but at any time black can close this bishop out of the game and in fact he's going to do that soon so rook g8 first though another kind of mysterious move as though uh, you know, m maybe you know he's supporting the idea of knight f5 to be able to, you know, bishop f5, g takes, and and again he'll have no points of attack. So he's fairly solid, it seems. So knight e2, knight f5. Uh, but I decide ambitiously to castle queen side. Um, en engine analysis is actually giving maybe you know c d might be an idea here. E g e takes, and then maybe castles, and then maybe h3. But I can't believe white has too much of an advantage here. But maybe this is actually more dynamic and fluid than the game. And the point here, I think, actually, um, is without that pawn on c4. Okay, there might be c4s from black, but uh, if black decides for d4, then c4 is a great square for a piece. So actually, this this is probably it, it, it is better than what I played. It's keeping some flexibility. It's extending the scope of this bishop. It's not being closed in like in the game. So I think this was a great idea actually that Rivka is presenting here. Okay, but anyway, I castle queen side and I allow a very stodgy position now with d4. Bishop shut out of the game. So positionally, I'm at c in this game. And you know, I've been wondering about certain issues from from that London Classic tournament. That um, you know, do, do, have I been missing resources in key moments? But now I think an issue on top of that is in trying to solve that issue is that although I I'm seem to be finding interesting resources, they're not really relevant for strategic play for strategic crush considerations. In fact, strategically, this has been a bit of a disaster. This game. So I might have been, you know, playing, t paying attention to little details in the position, but strategically I've been blown out of the water already. I don't deserve to win this game at move 13. He shut out the bishop. His bishop's got a nice diagonal here. He can prepare to castle queen side. F5 is nice. He's got loads of positional trump cards. I've been positionally done, and you know I've been thinking since last night. You know what? What is the cause of this? So it's not really attention to resources. It's you know resources need to be directed by a strategic plan. I want to try and fix issues in my game without creating other issues, and that's very very tricky. And um, by the way, I've got also an irritating ear blockage at the moment, so probably this video might I don't know if it's going to be too loud. I'm not I'm not trying to speak too loudly, but uh, uh, by the way, it's just an irritation, but. Um, but I, I didn't actually have that irritation last night. I'm not making that an excuse for this game last night. My hearing is perfectly okay last night. But I was just, just positionally blown out of the water here. And anyway, I mean, I, I think I've mentioned in, in live commentary videos a few times that there's actually other tools in the toolbox, yeah? Not, not just strategic clash, but the idea of preparing punches and positional sacrifices. But it's on the former, actually, to, on the latter, but positional sacrifices... I, I think actually more exist 
uh, than we imagine. So I'm making the claim that there's thousands of gambits if we include positional sacrifices. And we sort of define what they do in terms of structure, positional, you know, pawn structure um, or development. They seek to emphasize elements of the position and de-emphasize maybe the opponents. So if we go back, I've clearly missed the gambit which would have avoided this strategically busted position at move 13. I, I do consider it strategically busted. The bishop the bishop's blocked in. It's, it's horrible. You, you know, you wouldn't catch Kasparov, you know, playing this hotel. You know, it's, it's just stodge. It's, it's rubbish. But um, it seems technically I'm, I'm getting, according to the engine, a small advantage, but I don't think it's a big deal at all. Because black really hasn't got too many exploitable um, points in this position. We'll continue this game and then I'll show you a dynamic game in, in the same opening. Uh, to emphasize this idea, there's actually thousands of gambits in chess. So, knight h4, okay, I'm getting a bit excited because I'm going to centralize the knight on e4 maybe. I'm going to use that e4 square. So I'm focusing on the positive aspect of the position, the e4 square, fine. Bishop e7, another positive aspect, so I thought, was that given I can't play f5 because e5 is vulnerable because he's shut in my bishop, um, what about you know trying to peel open the h file and to do that what about playing g5 first so I've even got as well as this trump card I've got h4 h5 maybe get a rook to the seventh h7 you know maybe have tactical pressure that way fine but there's actually really no exploitable targets even this if this all happens like it does in the game so bishop b7 h4 so fine I'm getting that h I'm getting the rook to the seven it's all a bit academic because these exploitable points don't really exist he just plays solidly and is able to contest and put his queen on the first row to contest even my, my rook on on the seventh fine I've played d3 to be able to switch my queen to h2 so I'm getting a queen to, to h7 but big deal so what there's there's no there's no punch to this game. There's no the, the dynamism points of this game have been missed. Um, and I want to demonstrate why and with some other games actually. So a five, a four, even more stodge because I want to avoid you know a four possibilities and knight a fives. So stodge locked up position, hardly any breaks. I play king d two in preparation, you know, maybe knight b four might be um you know on d three. King seems safe enough on, on d2. King c8, he's just, just waiting around. Now I, I'm, I'm excited by this brilliant idea, this Nimzovician idea, that uh, I can play knight h1 like Nimzovich, you know. So, you know, it's knight f2 to g4 to h6, win this pawn, win the game. But unfortunately, uh, the illusion is dispelled with this next move, just knight d8, indicating um, not only is bishop e4 kind of strong, because if, if takes, you know, then there's queen c6, and if King D, I'm going, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit troublesome that because then you know maybe Queen B7, Knight C6 to B4. My King can't be a blockader on D3, and given that's the case, you know I can't allow this D takes. It, it seems too risky. This Bishop will be still hemmed in. It, it's actually not useful anywhere on this board because these pawns are all on that square as well, of, of that color square. So to so Knight F2, and I'm not really that optimistic anymore about this idea of Knight G4 to H6. Big deal. So King C7, I look around, it's a five board match, Alex seems to be doing well, uh, John's won I think at this point on board one, John Piggott. So we had a really strong team, Wilmot who's beaten an IM recently in London Classic, he's got a good position, so we've all got good positions. Dave Hutton, he's drawn on, on board five. I'm thinking, especially given Alex is doing alright, I, I can't break Black's position here, I've got no, no meaningful targets of attack, as usual in the Hearts League. You know, people are dead solid, they don't give you on a plate exploitable targets of attack you've got to really create them through great dynamism and hopefully early on in the game where they have maximum long-term impact throughout the whole game this idea of dynamism gambits positional sacrifices or tempo sacrifices to emphasize if there is going to be a strategic crush to emphasize those structural issues or opportunities all right this sounds like waffle okay but I'm going to try and make it a bit concrete very soon. Bishop a3, a draw offer, fine. Stodge game, forgettable, but the fun begins in the post-mortem. So in the post-mortem, John Piggott mentions that this idea was actually fine, except, except Black's tempo losing gambit. Play e5, gain the tempo on the knight, fine. But don't play f4. f4 is, is, a, is not that good to support e5. I've never had good results with f4. 
you know, I, I need to ban F4 from my games, you know, I think for a while, for the next few months. I never want to play F4 in the next few months, if I can help it. Just sacrifice pieces instead. Sacrifice his pawns. Don't play F4 in this type of position, giving F5. Avoid it at all costs. Okay, have I emphasised that enough? Maybe. But there's a beautiful idea here. And many, many players have trodden on this territory. And I don't know if you are aware of the amazing dynamism of this position. That really, what, what does White want to do structurally? White wants to break Black's bind on d4. Clearly Black's put a pawn on c5 to emphasise d4. There are other way, ways of emphasising d4 with other tempo losses. Uh, you know, like that e5 idea. Uh, you know, just here playing e5 is not ridiculous either. But c5 is not ridiculous either. So it seems in this position there are various tempo losing gambits Black can play to emphasise the d4 square. But what can White play? to break the bind of the d4 square and maybe emphasize you know black's put uh got a bit of a lag in development uh you know maybe these these pawns are theoretically weak if this bishop can be removed uh so maybe you know d6 uh you know this square and this square might be theoretically weak how on earth is that achievable is there a normal strategic crush route without losing material i don't think there is i think you you have to play sometimes dynamically so let's look at this. E5, knight, g8. Forget f4. Now I'm going to put uh, a GM game instead. So this is between, this is an example, between Dimitri Renderman, 2575, and Jan Well, 2565. They've both trodden this on this path. Just in the game in 2009. Okay. I'm going to get the PGN. I'm going to stick it in here, and we're going to see a dynamic treatment of this very same opening. Um, just to remind you of the Stodge game I had, okay, let's just briefly look at that. So it was Stodge, because of the main issue, the queenside bishop. I can't win this game if the queenside bishop is trapped in like this, and I haven't got any b4 breaks at any point, and the h-file is, is fairly academic here, that entry point on h7. There's no exploitable targets of attack. Okay, that was the Stodge game. Right, avoid stodge at all costs. Now, I'm going to paste in the dynamic treatment of this whole opening. And I, I don't know if you've been aware of this. That would be great. Tell me if you were aware of this gambit. There are probably thousands of gambits in chess we're, we're not aware of, aware of. Okay? Dimitri Renderman, it was in the Groningen Chess Festival of 2009. C4. Knight f6, and now as though Black's playing an Imza engine against the English. So it's interesting in its own right. You know, is this really you know a bad move? This e6, because you know isn't isn't e4 possible? That's the big question. So e4, and then c5 was played by Janwell, who's two five six five, slightly lower rated by Renderman. So e5 was provoked. It was played fine. The tempo losing gambit. Knight g8. Is White going to play? This proxy move f4, no, he plays knight f3. Okay, and I wonder if you can guess what's coming up. Knight c6 emphasizing d4, okay. Without using any material investment, black's emphasizing this gaping d4, d4 weakness. So this is the concrete example. This is a structural weakness. I'm saying there are thousands of gambits in chess, which we don't even know about. And they seek to emphasize structural weaknesses or opportunities. So, I wonder if you can guess this next move, even if you don't know the theory. If I give you uh, 10 seconds here, what would you consider playing as white for a dynamic active game? Uh, to reduce any peace issues on the queen side, to try and get rid of that gaping hole on d4. I'll give you 10 seconds from here. Okay. Now, I think this is incredibly hard to calculate. Um, it's just the product of theory. If you've guessed it, good. But I wonder if you've actually guessed all the backup ideas to this. So, d4. It seems a bit outrageous. You're giving up a whole center pawn. Because c takes d. You're not playing knight b5 here. That I think that would be terrible. Um, you're actually playing knight takes d4. And you're giving up e5, and this is what John was saying. There's, you know, it's a, it's a big trodden path. I've checked it out on Chess Gamescom. 
You see, white has broken that bind on d4. Black's only developed a piece, white's got two pieces developed. These dark squares are potentially, you know, they're lit up now because we're emphasizing with this positional sacrifice these dark squares and black's lagging them. And black's lagging queenside bishop. Forget this bishop being an issue. You want that bishop to be an issue, not this one. Fine. So you play knight b5 to try and blockade and get rid of uh, black's good dark square bishop. Good to leave this, you know, inverted commas, bad bishop. Okay. And black, believe it or not, is often playing in this position um, the move f6. And you might think f6 is ugly. This already justifies this kind of gambit. Because uh, white, you know, he's, he's playing a gambit here. What, what does black do here? Uh, there are other alternatives. And I could step with you, uh, you know, some f from chess games, Com. Uh, you know, let's do that. On the opening scroll, which I find a very useful tool at, at chess games, Com. Let, let's just quickly explore the candidate moves here for black. So c4, knight f6, I'm just getting to the position. So e6, e4, c5. So we're saying that there's thousands of gamuts, and this is one of the, the more odd ones, where black's kind of playing with seemingly fire, with tempo losing stuff, and white's giving up a whole e-pawn, advanced e-pawn, with this uh, d4 thrust. So in this position, after knight e5, Knight db5 is the key move, mo most played. Forget bishop f4. The candidate moves for black. Chess games have got a6, the most popular move, 45 games. f6, second most popular, 22. And d6, third. So with a6, okay, let's look at a6 um, just briefly. So knight d6, so robbing black of the dark square bishop. Uh, so, uh, okay, black hasn't on the bright side, it seems, played f6, fine. So maybe this, but now, but now plays f6. So why does black now have to play f6 and not say knight, uh, g, knight g6 has been played before? But let's, let's add, actually, the engine kibitzer here to try and justify this opening fear and why f6 needs to be played. So say knight c6. Okay, bishop e3, look, you're poking into these dark squares. Um, so say, I don't know, queen e7. Even bishop c5 here, just play a pawn down this position. Uh, so imagine this position, a pawn down. Uh, knight a4, it looks as though some nasty stuff is going to happen on these dark squares. For example, b5 ends up you know, with a small advantage for white in this in this line. Bishop takes b5, because, you know, look at black's pieces, they're not particularly great. Say rook here, as bishop c5, clear advantage for white, according to Ribka. So how did this all happen? This all happened from black's tempo losing gambit, and white, you know, aiming for these dark squares. So it's based on structure, this gambit. I don't know if we could deduce it without actually knowing the theory, though. It would be nice to imagine that we could deduce these things, that if you really want an active game, You've got to consider like the structural weaknesses and how you can break break binds if necessary. Investing material to break those binds and to exploit, you know, lagging development or weaknesses in the opponent's um, position at the same time. Ideally, so new, get rid of your own weaknesses and expose the opponent's weaknesses at the same time. Ideally, uh, so in theory, in theory, uh, there's 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 also there's also um, f6, okay. Uh, let, so let's just look at this other game anyway with f6. So bishop e3, and you'll see. Look, look how dynamically White's played this. He plays. Uh, he gets rid of Black's dark square bishop, uh, and now he gets onto that b6 square as well, which sometimes happens in the Morris Smith gambit. You're aiming for b6 as well to exploit Black's lagging development and pawns on knight squares. So knight f5. Now there's some delicate queen dancing moves. Queen c5, keeping hold of the bishop on b6, obviously. So d6, queen f5, keeping hold of the bishop on b6. The queen finally has to move. But now uh, Dimitri plays f4, chasing these pesky knights back. So the knight goes back to c6, chasing the queen again. The queen hits a3 to, on that d6 pawn. So the bishop's actually blockading a lot of black's queen side. 
You see, white hasn't got any, you know, big queenside issues. It's black with those issues. Uh, that's what you want the opponent to have those issues that you're worried about. Castling queenside, forget castling kingside. Again, d6 being targeted means g4 might be actually a threat. So queen c6 pinning down, you know, g4, but uh, and also attacking the bishop. But queen b3, okay. So white has to prepare g4, and he does so now with rook g1. So he's going to play g4, maybe bishop g2. So d5, trying to react to that, but uh, g4 played anyway. And now uh, it seems c4 is a bit weak, so c5 as though it's committing uh, and locking the, the, the pawns. But it doesn't matter. Look at black's queen side. White's also got d5 now as a target to undermine with like a bishop g2 and f5. So bishop g2. This is beautiful dynamic stuff compared to what I played. And you know, is it about strategic crush a lot of the time? If, if you don't have uh, the tools available of investing material to exploit structure, then you know it's it's a major bit missing i think dynamism is a major part of chess and this this gambit really does emphasize how dynamically the game you know could have been played if i'd known about the gambit or tried to you know somehow deduce the gambit by by pure luck but look look at how black's been undermined at all points now g5 as well trying to expose these these vulnerabilities you know e5 and and the g file um so the game continued actually d4. So white took, and now knight f5. So black, it seems to be playing very taxi, but the nice majestic rook, rook being kept on the fourth rank here, rook b4. So these knights are kept at bay, you know, from like knight d4s to b3. Rook a8, and now bishop takes c6, queen c6, and now rook e4 defending against that knight as well as this knight. So pinning it down to the rook on e8. And now we see rook f1. So both of these knights are under fire, actually. Queen e6 are now taking. Black's king is a bit more exposed. And now knight b5, emphasizing actually d6 and c7. Knight c7 is a major threat here, winning the exchange. Okay, bishop c7, putting more pressure again on e5. You know, black's placed, you know, all these pressure points on the dark squares. Uh, you know, this bishop's kind of dangerous. Uh, so bishop a5 actually is going to be more comfortable than c3 because it's pointing at that diagonal. These targets of attack. So bishop c3, look at the comfort now white has achieved with all this dark square pressure. So knight h6, queen h5. And now tactically, you know, black uh, blunders very soon. So rook g7, knight d6. Nasty threats are emerging like knight f5, forking these guys. And now we see knight f5. Black, you know, has actually blundered because he, he was banking on knight d3. Uh, you, you know, with with maybe uh, you know back row threats um, and other stuff. Um, if if the back row is going to get exposed, you know, like knight takes e1s. But actually, white has a nasty move. Knight takes g7. So he's actually attacking the queen. He just munched the bishop, attacking the queen. So it's a, been a big tactical um, blunder here. Um, I don't think there's a queen set with rook e4 here. Queen d5, rook e1, king b1, knight c1, king b1. I think the checks would run out there. Uh, so basically, uh, black's uh, you know lost here. He resigns here. He's just lost material. But contrast the dynamism of this game with my poxy game, and it shows you know this idea. I'm making a claim. I think today there are thousands of gambits in chess, often based on structure emphasizing structural weaknesses or debinding or you know the position to try and you know release the energy of your pieces trying to trap the opponent's pieces like like this shows you know this game if black has to play a move like f6 um, you know white can play the position as, as John said a pawn down quite often white has to be prepared to, you know to do this because uh, he's got certain trump cards especially this dark square bishop and this clamping on, on blacks um, dark squares so I thought this was a dynamic counter example to my stodgy game. But uh, imagine, you know, we think maybe chess isn't that dynamic, but it's incredibly dynamic. If you consider there aren't just the standard gambits in chess, but loads of other positional sacrifices you could play early, which we, we, which we have to really label as other gambits. So I don't know what you'd label this one. Um, I think it's called Mi the Mykonos. Uh, variation. Okay, so um, 
E5, Eng English Mykonos Coles, Sicilian variation, actually. So actually we've transposed into a variation of Sicilian, Mykonos Coles. So um, E5, and then we play Knight F3, and then we play uh, after Knight C6. So Black's just you know playing seemingly simple positional moves, but it's rudely interrupted with an ultra dynamic gambit now D4. So I, I I just think if if you want strategic crush based on pawn structure, and you want positional sacrifices as a part of your toolkit, I think they need to be maybe put at high priority uh, as any way of emphasising structural weaknesses to consider them at, at different points early on in the game, like here D4, uh, and it, a very 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 interesting idea, heavily trodden path, lots of players playing this E5 gambit with great success uh, in practice. I don't know, maybe the engines don't don't like it so much, this move D4, but it is it is listed actually by Ribka as one of the moves, but just, just not the strongest move. If we added Rib, Ribka here, just to show you, you know, how powerful theory is sometimes, uh, you know, Ribka is giving Bishop E2, but but uh, D3, and then D4 is shifting up actually at depth, depth 11 to give up. Uh, the e5 pawn. So Ripka's actually dynamically calculating this, that, 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 that there's compensation in this position. I mean, the bind has been broken on the d4 square. Um, so I don't know what you guys think of this. Um, I hope it's all new to you, this this gambit, uh, this this idea. I mean, there are other Sicilian variations where white's poking around the dark squares anyway. So maybe you, you would have deduced this, this maneuver. In, in the Sicilian... Uh, you know, Shvezhnikov uh, variation, you know, often there's these, these fancy knight maneuvers to exploit dark square weaknesses. Uh, but it's usually, you know, to provoke black later to, you know, get a gaping hole on d5 in, in, in the Shvezhnikov theory that I know. But, um, but here it's about really robbing that, that dark square bishop from black and playing on the dark squares yourself. Okay, I've waffled long enough, so, uh, maybe think about that notion there are actually thousands of gambits and, um, Please don't blame me when you lose loads and loads of games because you unsoundly sacrifice material. If you're going to sacrifice material, make sure there's a strategic justification though, in terms of you, you know you're either unbinding or it's based on pawn structure, uh, and then hopefully you'll lose uh, less games trying to play dynamically. It's going to be painful. The road's going to be painful, but maybe it's worth doing because otherwise, you know, a lot of our games we don't want to play these stodgy games with with regret afterwards. That there are all these lovely dynamic continuations. You know, they, they don't have to be held hostage to just if you're over 2,500 to play them. I think we can we can try and deduce a lot of this stuff ourselves because we can think about positional sacrifices as just ways of highlighting strategic aspects of the position and de-emphasizing the opponent's trump cards. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.